when you think about how many Ironmans I've done, I have also been doing triathlon for over 30 years at this point, which really makes me feel very old. Um, but you started, I started like when you're 10. <laughs> well, when enough. I was 14. Yeah. yeah, when I was 14, I started doing triathlons. Okay, there we go. That's perfect. Happy birthday. Thank you. That means a lot. <laughs> Are you uh, having a good day so far? I am. I did my run this morning, so that was good. Yes, that's always a good way to start the day. Yes. So, um, are you having a good day? Yes, I am. I haven't done any workouts yet, but I will later. Awesome. Well, thank you for taking the time to um, meet with me. I wanted to interview you because you are one of the strongest women I know. Oh, thank you. And I thought, well, who better to interview than you? Oh, I appreciate it. I think this is a neat idea. So, yeah, I thought I was like, well, I'm doing, um, it's called Moxie and I started it six years ago. And it's really interesting, Katie, because when you sent me that, um, the text before my race, you said it will, the race will be like a mirror of life with extreme highs and extreme lows. And um, Moxie is actually Moxie mirror, the idea of looking in the, the mirror and having that courage. And so I was like, wow, that was really powerful. <laughs> and you didn't even know like how, no. um, how deep that was for me. And so um, I was like, well, I definitely want to talk to Katie. Um, so thank you for your time today. Oh, my pleasure. Um, and I kind of want to get to know you more because I'm um, and have other people know why you do what you do um, because you're amazing. Uh, I mean, is 30 the right count or is it more now for how many Ironman races you've done? I don't really count. Um, it's somewhere around 30. It might be 31. It might be 32. I, I don't, I really don't like have a count anywhere. I, I always say, oh, I should go back and try to figure out all the ones that I've done and how many times I've done them. And I just have never done it. I started to, and I'm like, Oh, I think I'm missing one. And, and I never finished it because, um, I don't think at the end of the day, that is really what matters. Um, every race is different. Every situation going into every race is different, you know, from a personal, uh, standpoint also physically. So I, um, I'm not really so concerned about like setting any record or how many I've done. It's just about the fact that I've done a lot of them. Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, I'm blown away. And I mean, Ironman is just one. I mean, you, you do triathlons even in just the state. So I, I'm just thinking you're just constantly preparing, which is really neat. I just stay prepared. Um, it's, it's not, you, you know, because I do race a lot. Um, I always say, if you want to be good at something like do it frequently. And so doing races that are local, um, on a regular basis, they just really kind of keep me in race shape and race mentality. Um, and so I'm very, like, I, I just have a system that I go through before every race. I always do the same things. I pretty much eat the same things, even though that's kind of boring. Um, but I'm pretty careful about what I eat before a race because um, that can really take the enjoyment out of a race if you eat something bad the night before. Um, so I think that with the local races, like that's kind of my fun. Um, I enjoy the people as much as I do the races. And a lot of times they're shorter, which is kind of like a reward. Um, I love the longer distances, but usually we don't have that many of them that are close by. Um, I think too, you know, for anybody who might watch this, when you think about how many Ironmans I've done, I have also been doing triathlon for over 30 years at this point, which really makes me feel very old. Um, but you started, I started like when you're 10. <laughs> Well, when I was 14, yeah. yeah, when I was 14, I started doing triathlons. So when you start like getting up there, like with the 30 Ironmans, like really, you know, I do, I used to do anywhere from two to four a year. 
so, and now I just usually do one a year and maybe one or two half Ironman races a year and that's it. So that's actually a big step back for me. Um, but it's like, I do one a year cause I'm like, okay, I just need to have that level of fitness every year to know that I can do it. Yeah. You're, you're an inspiration. And as you're talking, I'm thinking, well, um, for people that are listening to this and when people are say, well, Brinley, how did you do this? I'm like, I had a coach, I had Katie that made a plan for me. And so all I had to do is submit, as long as I submitted to the plan, I trusted Katie to know that what I needed to do. And if I didn't right. do it, well, then I wasn't going to be able to do it. And so um, I just wanted to, do, for you to chat about like the importance of coaching and, and how coaching has played into your life and then how, um, why you decided to, to be a coach and share your knowledge as well. Right. So, you know, early on, um, I, I always wanted to do Ironman. That was, and I think I say a little bit about this on my website, but my whole goal when I wanted to do Ironman was to do the Hawaii Ironman in Kona, which was at that point then the world championships. Um, it was one of the only Ironman races that was even in the U.S. Um, when I was a little kid, you would see it on the NBC Wide World of Sports. I don't know that that TV show even exists anymore, but um, we would watch it every year. Um, like my father would sit down with me on a Sunday afternoon and we'd watch the Ironman and I'd be like, that is amazing. I want to do that. And it always stuck with me. Like I would always come back to it and I'd be like, okay, well, you know, if I ride my bike, um, um, okay, I've got part of it. You know, now I started, and then I started running. First, I was riding my bike with my parents. They would uh, take me on pancake rides on the weekends, which would mean we'd ride from a parking lot to a firehouse, which up north in New Jersey, they would have um, pancake breakfast every Sunday morning. And so we'd ride to the pancake breakfast, eat breakfast, and then ride back. So it would be 20 miles total. Um, and you know, when you're like, eight to 10 years old, like that's a pretty big ride. Um, usually it was a bit more than I wanted to do by the end of it, but you know, the pancake breakfast, it was a big deal. It was a social thing. So I really enjoyed doing that with my parents. Um, but that was, that was kind of like the beginning. And then when I was 10 or 11, I started running with my mother some. Um, we had a little bit of a track group and there was a coach who would give everybody a workout. So I'd go with my mom sometimes, you know, he'd be like, oh, do, do a 200, do a 400. And so I started like learning about that and I really enjoyed it. And I was the only kid who was going with their parents at that point. Um, so it kind of made me feel special. And I was like, okay, I can bike and I can run. And I'm like, now all I need to do is the swim. Um, I could swim, but not like swim team swim. But that didn't really stop me. I'd get in the lake anyway, and I'd be like, okay, I'm going to swim to my friend's boathouse. And so I'd swim, which my friend's boathouse was, in all honesty, it was probably 200 meters away from my boathouse. It was not a big swim. But when you don't really know what you're doing, 200 feels like a lot. Um, and so that's kind of where like my mentality uh, started, like, oh, I can do this, you know, this is the beginning of my Ironman training. And so I already was thinking that way, like when I was 10, 12 years old. So then when I found a triathlon to do when I was 14, you know, I had to ask my mom if she would drive me there. Hey, mom, you know, I want to do a triathlon. Will you take me to it? And she was like, okay. Um, she wasn't real wild about driving me there because part of the reason why I rode my bike so much is because my mother would not drive me anywhere. She always said, if you want to go there, ride your bike. Wow. That was her motivation. Um, so like to get from my parents' house to our lake house, it was, I think, seven or eight miles one way, very hilly. And I had to ride there if I wanted to go any other time than when my parents were going. So, you know, I, I kind of had motivation or if I wanted to go to a friend's house or whatever like she was like you can go but i'm not gonna drive you so i got really used to riding my bike a lot 
Um, we live in a really rural area, so nothing was close. Um, and I probably rode on roads that today I would never ride on, but not knowing. <laughs> That's why you don't let little kids ride their bikes by themselves. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, so that was, that was another, you know, just like piece of the puzzle with the biking and the running, the swimming slowly came. Um, then I got into water skiing. And so I kind of took a break from triathlon. I did, I still rode my bike and ran, but I got more into where I wanted to ski all the time. So I'd like run to stay in shape for skiing or I'd ride my bike a little bit. Um, I was an exchange student in Germany. And when I was there, they had a triathlon club in the next village over and they had an indoor swimming pool that was easy to get to and close by. Um, and they also had a coach for the club. And so they'd have club workouts all year long. And I did those. And that's where I learned a lot because it was my first experience ever having a coach for a triathlon. Um, and things there are very rigid and strict. And we did strength training in the winter. We did bike trainer workouts. We rode outside pretty much all year. And the swimming was, it was swim heavy. So that was kind of like my first true foray into learning technique. And at that time I was 17, 18 years old. And so that's when I really started to learn to swim. Still, I was not a good swimmer by any means, but enough where I was like, okay, this is fun. You know, I kind of know what I'm doing. Um, or I knew enough to know that I didn't swim well enough, but it still was fun and I enjoyed the training and the people. And again, I was one of the younger people in the group. So I kind of felt special. I was like, oh, all these people are older than I am, but it was, it was just my thing. Um, then I came back to the US. I ran cross country in college um, because you know they didn't really have triathlon in college at that point. Mm -hmm. um, but running seemed to be a good option, running cross country. Um, learned a lot about myself, learned a lot about volume, um, watching people get injured constantly in cross country because coaches would just pile on the miles in hopes that runners would run better. And everyone just ended up injured, including myself. Um, and so once people were injured, then, you know, they would always say, oh, get on your bike. But most people didn't have that skill to be able to transfer like a workout to their bike. And so like, I was like, oh, well, at least I can, I can ride my bike and really get a good workout and then still be able to run a little bit. Um, but that was kind of like the beginning of my paying attention to what the coach was doing and thinking, yeah, this isn't working. You know, he's trying to have everybody do the same thing and it's not working for anybody. Like the girls who should be running really fast they're being held back. Everybody else is getting hurt. And I'm like, we don't have a good team like that. So uh, probably that was my first thought of, hmm, I could, I could coach, but at the same time, I was like, I need to get an office job because, you know, when you're in college, you are supposed to graduate and get an office job, um, which is, it seems so exciting at the time. And then you get the office job and you realize it's not very exciting at all. <laughs> it's um, a huge disappointment. But, you know, once I kind of got to that point where I was working and had the office job and I couldn't see a window, um, I went probably a year doing nothing, like no exercise, because I was trying to work the 80 hour work week that's kind of expected for people coming in, starting out, you know, you got to prove yourself. Um, and then I got to where I was like, I'm going to work out at lunch every day. They had a gym, they had a shower, I would go do a workout. And that was kind of where I was like, I need to get back in shape. This is not okay to be doing nothing. Um, and it was about that time that I thought I'm going to do, I'm going to do my Ironman. I had written it down as one of my senior goals when I was in college. And it was kind of like a pie in the sky, kind of, I'm going to do Ironman. And then 
I just, I called a couple of triathlon coaches too around that time. Um, mm -hmm. I was living in Phoenix and I called the first couple coaches that I called. I said, I want to do Hawaii. I want to do the Ironman. And they literally laughed at me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, okay, well, didn't see that coming. And I'm like, okay, you know, thanks for your time. Never mind. Um, the tri club that I was in, again, I had a good experience with a triathlon club in Phoenix because we, um, there was like a big group of athletes there. And the one guy who always came to speak to our club, his name was Joel Friel. Mm -hmm. And he wrote that little book called Triathletes Training Bible. Um, and his, well, Joe Friel and Joel, they are two separate people. It's father and son. Okay. But they um, also came up with Training Peaks. They wrote the book, Triathlete Training Bible. Um, and so they would both come to this club and speak. Uh, I didn't realize the significance of that at the time. But, you know, so I was definitely getting fed really good advice, um, considering uh, that I didn't even know who they were. Um, but I don't know that they were really a thing yet, like that. I don't know that anybody knew who they were or how scientific their training really was. So did a lot of um, running with that tri club, some biking, um, enjoyed what Arizona had, but you know, I really missed my trees back in the East. Um, and so I ended up coming after that, I went to the Netherlands um, for work and the tri club there was amazing. Um, by far the best tri club I've ever been a member of, um, in terms of the workouts, the cycling, um, just everything and the quality of the athletes, um, where I really started getting pushed, um, by other people. And I was like, oh, this is fun. Um, we go to races together. I accidentally entered my first pro race, um, in Germany that year. I did not know that it was only for pros. Um, but when I was standing on the start line and I looked next to me and there were people who had been in the Olympics, I realized very quickly this was not going to end well. So I tried to step out and, you know, just, I was like, Hey, I am, I am in the wrong race. And they're like, no, you came all the way from America. And I was like, no, I didn't. I'm living in the Netherlands and I don't want to be in this race. And they're like, Oh, just go ahead. Don't worry about it. I was the last person out of the water. I had the kayaker paddling next to me and I, I said to him, don't worry, I'm okay. I'm just slow. Don't, I shouldn't be in this race. Um, on the bike, I had to borrow a bike because I had a tri bike and in draft legal racing, that's not allowed. So somebody gave me their bike, um, which was too big. I got lapped on the bike, of course. I mean, I'm in there with Olympians, um, had a great run absolutely great run and the German newspaper they were just so kind and they said you know this girl sucks at triathlon and she should stick to running so um that was that was my first uh you know professional race I had um an escort the whole time the motorcycle because I was last so you know it uh, <laughs> definitely is one of those things I look back on and I'm like oh my gosh what was I thinking but it just is all part of the experience that you get from challenging yourself to race in uncomfortable situations. Um, and, you know, I figure if I could make it through that, it, it doesn't matter. And people always say to me, oh, you don't know what it's like to be last. Yes, I do. I actually do. Um, and, and I don't think that that matters. It's how you handle it. Um, the whole attitude is everything. It, it really is because it's, it's about what you're doing and you're doing, most of us are doing it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um, so that we can feel better mentally, physically, and just challenge ourselves because, you know, thankfully we're not out hunting and gathering at this point in uh, a civilization. So we need physical challenges. Um, and I think triathlon really kind of delivers that, but also gives us that mental stimulation to um, just see kind of how we hold up against that. And it makes us stronger for the every day. And really it's the every day that matters so much. Um, you know, you've got three little boys that you have to keep up with. And it's like, you need to be fit. You can't 
you can't be sitting on the sofa um, because they will destroy your house in about five minutes of watching TV. Exactly. And so it's, you want to be healthy to be able to keep up with the day to day, but also just not fight all the diseases that are out there. Um, so I think if you can have a sport and a hobby that you enjoy that never gets boring, because like, even if you can't run, you can bike and you can swim or you can do the strength training or the yoga, like it all fits together with, um, with life. Uh, and life is about balancing everything. And so is triathlon. I love that. Um, what would your advice be for someone that's thinking about it? Um, I've had some people reach out to me and say, like, I don't know how you did it. And I said, well, I had a plan and I stuck to it that I didn't just wake up one day and say, oh, I'm just going to do this tomorrow. Um, what would your recommendation be? Uh, some tips for people that are thinking about it um, in, in kind of that coaching element with you um, because I, you know, I had to start small and, and you didn't discourage me. So um, yeah. I wanted to kind of hear your input of, because you have athletes, you coach athletes from like newbie Brinley to like very well-performing athletes. So um, I kind of want to share that, like you don't, sometimes people equate, you have to be at a certain level to have a coach. And it's like, no, you want to coach so that you can progress. So just wanted you to share about that, that. I think that that is really important because um, like a great question, just because so many people, they're like, where do I even start? Um, and a lot of people don't want to hire a coach to begin with because they're like, well, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, how is this going to work? I feel like a coach cuts the learning curve. And especially like with somebody like me, and there, there are other coaches who do similar things that I do, but because I've been doing it so long, I've kind of like <laughs> narrowed it down to what's really important, like what you really need to have when you start out. It doesn't have to be a fancy bike, but you do have to follow my program. Like you have to do the intervals. You have to do the strength training. And so I can kind of guide people through that and guide them what they need to buy. So they're not just buying everything on the market. I also think that reading is really important. Um, and I know, I feel like we're kind of to the point in society where people don't like to read about things. They want like a two sentence answer and then they're ready to figure it out themselves or do trial and error versus reading more. Um, I think that there's so much good information out there um, to read and then come with questions like to somebody like me and say, well, here's what I'm thinking. What do you think? Um, I have a lot of people, even people that I coach who are like, well, I want to, you know, I want to do an Ironman. Well, that's great. I mean, I love to hear people say they want to do an Ironman, but for some people I'm like, wow, you know, you've got five kids. Um, is that realistic? You know, your husband works uh, crazy hours, you know, don't you think it would be better to do like a sprint or a half or something that's manageable. But also um, I like to help people pick the races that they do because if you end up picking races that don't fit with your life um, or you know don't fit with the schedule or things you have going on, like you're never gonna be able to get that training in that you need. And I think that's where a lot of people make a mistake. They're like, they just wanna do a race because their friend is doing it, but yet, they forgot to tell me that they're going to be traveling across the country with their four kids for the entire summer. Um, all of a sudden, training becomes super challenging. Training is hard enough to do when you're on a day-to-day -day schedule, as much as you can be when you have little kids. Um, you, you want to set yourself up to win. And that's where I kind of help talk you through to figure out like what's realistic. Um, and I think that's really helpful with races. I wish somebody had done that with me. Mm -hmm. um, I think early on when I was racing, I like signed up for Ironman New Zealand. That was like a terrible idea. On paper, it looked super fun, but it's in the winter, like all winter and it's an Ironman and I can't swim in the lake in the winter. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, and then travel to New Zealand for a race. I mean, that's like 24 hours of travel, also taking your bike, 
you know, you have to take your bike apart, pack it up. There's no tri bike transport to New Zealand. Um, so there are a lot of like things that you might not think about just because you don't know. And so I try to advise people very carefully. Um, and I think too, when you're working one-on-one -on -one with a coach, you can get so much more out of it because you can just ask questions and you build that relationship where it's like not surprising and you don't have to be embarrassed, you know, like if you have a saddle sore. Um, and, you know, I always feel bad for people like when they're like, I have a problem. And I'm like, trust me, I've probably heard it before. Um, it's, you just have to share it with me so we can figure it out or work around it. And with triathlon, you have, you know, three sports plus some strength training, you have lots of options. Um, you're never like stuck where you can't do anything. Um, so I think you get a lot more out of working one-on-one -on -one with a coach and just like with anything, all coaches aren't made the same. Um, everybody works a little bit differently. Everybody has their own philosophy. And, you know, sometimes people come to me and they're like, what's your philosophy? And I'm like, wow, my philosophy. Um, you know, it's that it takes hard work. It takes dedication. It takes consistency. But if there's anything that I've learned over 20 years of coaching, it is that no two people are the same. And it doesn't matter even if they run the same, they're not going to bike the same, they're not going to swim the same, and their schedule and their life is not going to allow them to do the same thing. Um, and somebody just last week, you know, they were like, well, train me like you'd train a pro. And I'm like, oh, okay. I'm like, but when are you going to sleep? And when are you going to go to work? Um, you know, like I could deliver that training program to anyone they wouldn't be able to do it and recover. Right, right. And I, I've really changed a lot of my thinking in terms of volume, especially as athletes tend to be older. Younger people can handle a little bit more, but younger people are also much worse about getting sleep. Right. And the sleep allows you to recover. And if you don't recover, then you get injured. So my goal as a coach is to keep you healthy and save you from yourself. That's probably my philosophy. That's really good. Sleep. Um, I know that Sean Stevenson, um, someone that I've read before, uh, well, this, he has a book called Sleep Smarter, and it is about the importance of sleep. Um, I, I would love, Katie, for you to kind of speak into that because I've, I've heard on our calls before you talking to another person of like, well, when did you go to bed? And then they got up like four hours later and I was thinking, how are they even on this bike, uh, like training this morning? Um, so can you speak into that? Cause I think that's really powerful that sometimes people hone in on the physical activity and it's like, no, what are you, how are you recovering? What are you putting into your body? What are you, how are you treating your body? So. Yes. Um, that's a great question. So sleep, is one of those things that nobody really likes to talk about because it's not very exciting, not very sexy, um, but it is so needed um, because if you don't recover, you won't make the gains that you need with your training. And I think most triathletes, I'm just gonna go out on a limb and generalize, are a little bit type A. And they like to burn the candle at both ends, you know, maybe work a little later, get up a little earlier. And while you might be able to do that for a couple days, once in a while, if you get into the habit of constantly depriving yourself of sleep, um, also referred to as chronic sleep deprivation, you will get in trouble very quickly. And the more training you do, the worse it is for your body. Um, and that's where I see people either get injured. Um, I've seen people get like um, chronic fatigue syndrome, which is a thing that you never get rid of. Um, so that's kind of scary when you think about that, um, a chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, there's also like Epstein-Barr syndrome, I believe, which kind of falls into that category of chronic sleep deprivation and constantly feeling bad. And those aren't necessarily things that you get over. And I'm not saying that not sleeping does that to you, but it doesn't help you. Right, right. Um, and you know, when you have little kids too, 
you tend to be up in the middle of the night, so you're not getting as good quality sleep as you might um, otherwise, which makes it even more important to like get in bed when your kids get in bed um, or as close to it as you can. But at the same time, everybody's like, oh, I've got all this stuff I need to do once my kids are in bed. And then you kind of get yourself awake again and you're going and all of a sudden it's 11 o'clock. You've got to get up at 4.30 to do your workout and you're just shortening that amount of time that you're sleeping. So I am constantly reminding people that sleep is important and that you've got to do it to allow yourself to recover. Um, naps are a great option. Personally, I can't nap. Um, mm -hmm. I, I wake up, like if I finally do lay down and take a nap, I'm exhausted mm -hmm. and it's gonna be three hours of napping. I'm gonna wake up in a bad mood and I'll be way behind in my whole day. So I typically don't nap, but I might try to get in bed a little bit earlier. Um, I generally get up at four every day. So that means I really need to be in bed at nine. But all of a sudden you have kid activities, things going on, and I'm not in bed till 10. Then I will try to adjust a little so that I don't get up till five but my body just automatically wakes up at four. So it's very easy for me to get off my schedule and it's usually not good. Right, yeah, I feel you on that. <laughs> That's... Well, and if you get up early, you wanna go to bed early. Right, if you, do you it feel it, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, your body's saying like, it's time, it's time to go to sleep. So. Right. But it's, you've got to develop that routine and it takes, um, it takes really 21 days to develop a habit. So it's not something, you know, you're going to do for a couple of days and be like, I've got this. Um, right. You constantly have to revisit it. Uh, that's great advice. Um, what are your, so we kind of, do you think that the race, um, the professional race that you entered accidentally, was that your lowest low? Um, moment of your career um or is there another moment that comes to mind that was um, hard you know no I don't I didn't even it didn't even bother me that I was last and it it wasn't a low moment it was really exciting because I ran so well um right. and I never I didn't know I was entering a professional race so I had no nerves going into it, you know, until I was standing there on the line going, oh, this is not good. Like these people were in, oh my gosh, like that girl's from Australia. She was in the Olympics. Oh, and that, oh no. Um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a stressful situation at all. Um, I think, you know, my, my, the thing that sticks in my mind the most um, is probably um, being one of the worst memories of triathlon for myself is, um, there was a professional triathlete. I won't mention her name, but I looked up to her from the time I was like a little kid. She was out there winning Ironmans and I just thought she was amazing. I mean, she was my everything. I had her on this pedestal. Um, I just, you know, how this woman did all that. I'm like, wow. And, so when I finally got to the point where I was racing and I was racing as a professional and I had the opportunity to meet her and she was not nice at all or encouraging, um, I was shocked, I was disappointed and I think really disillusioned with, you know, here's somebody who I've looked up to all these years and she's not really a very nice person. Mm -hmm. So I guess the lesson that comes from that is it doesn't matter how fast you are, you should still be nice. And I love that about you and what you do with your team is that you constantly remind us to like smile and say thank you to the volunteers and to also volunteer ourselves. And so I love that that's part of your DNA that that out of that terrible moment like something has become part of your culture of your brand of like that you treat everyone with kindness and you yourself i mean there's 
tons of us that look up to you and you're so kind oh. and um like it, it just shows that you took that and you didn't make it you weren't negative about that and that's so strong and that you were like okay well not gonna be like that gonna be like this and you can no, say you can see that with your athletes it and, and I think like with my athletes and and with our team in general um I do think it's important to be a good person like I don't care how fast you are if you can't be nice if you can't be kind, if you can't be kind to the beginners on the team, you know, if you're really fast and you won the race, but you're not acting nice towards someone else, like I would not have a problem saying, you know, like if you can't be nice and behave, and be kind and be respectful, like maybe I'm not the coach for you because our team in general, um, I set that expectation and I, I behave that way myself when I am on that race course or when I'm at a race, because it's not about that. Like there's always going to be somebody faster than you are. Yeah. Um, there, there's no room for that kind of ego anywhere. Um, and I mean, I dislike it in triathlon. I dislike it in all areas of life. Um, and I think it's, it's like the only way that I can kind of have a good influence on people in terms of behavior. Um, but in general, it's really not a problem because that expectation is always there. And I think usually people come to our team where they're like, oh my gosh, you know, one of your athletes cheered for me. One of your athletes, you know, gave me their bike pump. One of your athletes changed my tire. Um, because I will always do that for anybody before a race. Even if I'm racing, I'm like, oh, we got to change your tire. No problem. Like I don't start my race until I'm in the water and the horn is being blown. Um, up until that point, I can always do whatever I need to, to help my athletes. Really, I would help anybody, but my athletes do come first. <laughs> um, you know, like I, I always make sure everybody's good. I don't see any of my athletes like lingering in transition or having issues. Um, but I think that it's just part of the way that we can be a team um, when we're out there and how we kind of make a difference and differentiate ourselves from some of the other teams because people always say to me, your team's so friendly. <sighs> Good. That's what I want to hear. I mean, like, it's great that we have some people who are winning their age group and who are fast and who are doing well, but I would rather any day have somebody say, your team's so nice. Your team's so helpful um, because that's really what it's about. And even when I'm racing with some of the girls who are faster, um, you know, we, we talk, most of us do. Um, there are some people who, you know, they're very serious about what they're doing and I respect that. Um, and you know, if they're not going to be friendly, I just hope I'm faster than they are. <laughs> you know, that's all I go. Now I really want to beat you. Um, so I just <laughs> let it serve as motivation. Cool. I love that. Yeah. Um, well, Katie, I, I, um, thoroughly enjoy being coached by you and, um, yes, I do respect all that you do and, I hope that I can help promote your brand um, because I believe like whenever I was looking for a coach, I was calling people and trying to figure out. And I remember entering the winter challenge um, and I did it without a coach um, because I was just mad that one of my uh, friend, one of my girlfriend's husband had drowned. And so I, I paddled during the winter months and I was like, and, and I just, came across the winter challenge and I was like well I'll do that um and I remember seeing you and you were the winner and I was like who is Katie Malone and that is how I found you out and I remember calling you and you were going on a girl's trip and you're like I'll call you right back whenever I get back and you did and I just remember being like she's it she's it for me and, and how you're talking about how there's different coaches for different people um I just loved your spirit of adventure and that you love a lot of different sports like skiing and um, horseback riding, whatever it is, you're, you have a spirit of adventure and that goes into your training where you're like, just have fun. Like um, you, like the race was stressing me out just a little bit because I was like, oh, what did I do? Um, and you're like, it's just the icing on the cake. You've done the work. And that took that pressure off of me. Um, so thank you. Right. 
Well, I, I do definitely believe in having fun and, you know, during the off season, like getting on your mountain bike, paddling, paddling is great cross training for swimming. Um, because part of it is like, it's using everything, but also mentally to be able to clear your mind and get out in nature. And, you know, there's a time when you really need to focus on your training, but like typically during the off season, that's why I love winter challenge. It's just kind of like mix, it mixes it up. It makes you get out and paddle in the winter when you probably wouldn't otherwise, <laughs> but it's just also a neat race. And we have so many opportunities like that to have fun with our fitness. Um, it's fun to race like a serious race or your half Ironman where you really test yourself. But the real joy for me comes in a race like Winter Challenge where I'm just out there with people, just loving every moment of it. And that's, that's what makes it so special. And I'm glad that you have that same sense of adventure. Well, thank you. Um, well, is there anything else that you would like? Because I feel like you have done such a beautiful job of saying like, here's why I'm in triathlons. Here's why I coach. Um, and, and my goal for this was I just wanted to share uh, Katie with my friends. Uh, and and um, because I really did think I was like, all right, if I'm getting these questions, I need to connect them with the person behind like, why Thanks. I'm able to do these things. So that, that was the goal of this um, was for me to share you with them and for people to see your spunky personality and that you're a mom, Kane's seven, right? You know, and, and you Her do eight. all these things. Or eight. So you do all these things too, like you're balancing life. And so you can, you have empathy um, for schedules, but you also are an example that it can be done. If you want to do it, you're going to say no to those Netflix shows or whatever that you're doing, like, and you're going to choose to get on your trainer or um, you're going to choose to get up earlier um, and get more sleep, you know, things like that. It is a lifestyle for sure in every way. And it is, um, I think one of my best coaches that I ever had for myself, I realized how empathetic he was and how kind he was and how encouraging he was. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow. That is what made the difference for me with everything. When I was working with him, he was just always encouraging. And, you know, sometimes you'd be like, well, you could do this a little bit better, or you could do that a little bit better. And I realized that by working with him, I became a much better coach. And because I realized the importance of that communication and that, yes, you're on the right track, keep going. Okay, no, you kind of messed up last week. Let's get back on track but it was always encouraging and it was always kind. And you can be competitive, like as a coach, you can be successful as a coach by being kind. Um, you don't have to be hardcore. You don't have to put people down or to raise yourself up or be condescending. Like nobody likes that. There's enough of that in life. Um, most of us are doing this for fun. Um, and I need to keep that at the forefront of my mind that our families who support us, like we do need to take time off. And that's why I am all about having at least one or two days off a week. We need it. Um, you know, sometimes you might have to sneak a workout in that you didn't get done some other day, but you need to have that flexibility and you need to have that recovery mentally, um, especially when you've got little kids. Um, you know, they, they, they need a lot of things. <laughs> right. So... But, um, but thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. And it's, it's just fun to see you and how you've developed as an athlete and how you continue to push yourself. Um, you know, it's just kind of like the sky's the limit. Um, you're going to keep getting stronger and faster as you go. And it's, it's fun for me to see what your dedication is doing. And I know it's not easy. Well, thank you. Um, well, well, for the end, to wrap this up, Katie, I just wanted you to share like, what is, you might've already kind of said it, but what has been the biggest highlight or reward of your, um, your career of racing and, or it could be coaching or it could be both. I just wanted to know kind of what is so far been one of the highlights. Um, hmm. I think like my real highlight 
on a yearly basis. It's, it's the successes that my athletes have um, where I've set them up for wins. And I've always said to people, I'm like, oh, I don't have to win anymore. You know, I don't, I don't have to perform to some high level as long as everybody else I coach is doing what they're supposed to be doing and they're successful, that's like my success. Um, and so I don't feel like I have to be doing that all the time anymore, as long as I'm giving good advice and good guidance, but it's by far more rewarding to watch people I coach do well than to do well myself. So speaking of coaching, how can people connect with you, Katie? Um, I'll put in the the notes like your website um do you recommend people reaching out by email or uh, direct email message? yeah email or text or you know facebook or instagram messages i do look at all of them um i'm, I'm getting better at keeping up with all the different ways there are to connect these days okay perfect because i'm gonna so link any, that any place okay wonderful thank you absolutely because i i believe like i've benefited so much from it and I think that others will most definitely benefit from it, um, coaching with you. So um, thank you for your generosity of sharing what you know um, and that you continue to push yourself because you just, it just shows um, you're not a coach that has kind of stopped, like you're continuing to push. And I, and I love watching that and love, and I love seeing us cheer for you. Like we're like, yes, Katie's racing, you know, like what is she doing? She is out in Washington doing what, you know, like, doing some exactly. wild race. Like, and I love that. Cause I'm like, well, gosh, she is, I just love her spirit of adventure, swimming in really cold water and running on an Island. I mean, then it just shows me like, Oh, I've never even knew that existed. Like, so. It's Thank a new you. sport. It is a new sport. It's called swim run. Um, and it's swim and run put together. Um, it's like a new emerging sport. And I actually am working on putting together an article about it because I feel like most people don't know what it is. They're <laughs> like, you do what? Um, so I will have an article out about that within the next week. That'll be perfect. And I'd love to share that too, because it is pretty incredible just what you're doing and, I'm, and I am fascinated by it so anyway you do it you. as a team as well which is um which makes it even more special so one of the girls who I used to coach Abby Russell has been my swim run partner um and our goal is to eventually be ranked high enough that we would be able to get invited to the world championships for swim run that is so, awesome <laughs> so we're pushing even though we're older we're like we're not going to give this up we're going to no, i love that goal yeah because i mean when you were younger you had the goal of um hawaii which you did i i do want to yeah. just circle back to that and say like you did accomplish that goal even though someone you know you didn't let someone saying like that's funny you want to do that you were like no i'm going to do it you didn't let that discourage you um, right and so and now i love this goal so we'll watch you achieve it thank you Thank you. Well, I really appreciate this. It was just fun, nice to do, fun to talk, but um, we'll talk more on our Zoom calls while we're biking. Yes. Well, thank you, Katie, and I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye. Bye.